Now, NDE Radio, a weekly exploration of near-death experiences and similar encounters with the other side. Now, here's your host, Lee Whitting. Welcome to NDE Radio with Lee Whitting. Whether you're listening on TalkZone, by podcast, through the archives of our ad-free shows on our YouTube channel, or connected through the incredible content of our Facebook page. From time to time, I like to read some NDE reports and spiritually transformative experiences from the files of IONS, the International Association for Near-Death Studies. They are examples of just how important the numerous services of IONS can be. Stories like these are sent out monthly to members, and the IONS annual conferences are inspirational. By the way, the 2024 conference is planned for the Phoenix, Arizona area, over this summer's upcoming Labor Day weekend, so check out the IONS website for details. The following two selections were taken from accounts submitted to IONS and are provided here anonymously. IONS is grateful to those who have sent accounts of their experiences. In this account, a 50-year-old Australian man has a near-death-like experience while feeling hopeless and suicidal. He was caught in a vicious cycle of anger and bitterness, which he couldn't seem to shake. The experiencer writes, I thought what happened to me couldn't possibly be a near-death experience because I wasn't close to death. I later found out this is still possible. In September 1996, due to a buildup of circumstances over a 10-year period, I was suicidal. I was laying on my bed, needing to go to work, stuck in a situation that seemed hopeless to me. I really wanted to die, and it was the only way I could see out of the mess I was in. Suddenly I became aware of a black spot at the corner of the ceiling, and instantly I was in a dark space, but aware of a spot of light at the end of it. I was in a tunnel and moving towards the light. I was intensely aware that the walls of this tunnel were of living blackness, It was a warm, velvety substance. It was loving, warm, supportive, positive. And none of these words even begin to describe this adequately. I also realized then that I was not in my body. A light appeared, moving gently toward me, and developed into an angel. Quite tall, wings, golden white, glowing bright, both intense to my eyes and yet soft. He, she had all the usual robes, the way angels are depicted here on earth, except the quality, affect, or radiance this angel had about it was indescribable. Just to be in the presence of this was to be a part of it. There were no words. We just knew. I was shocked and thought, this is crazy. I don't believe in angels. His, her laughter was an indescribable quality that was, in a sense, always present flowed out like ripples, was tangible in that as the laugh flowed through me, it was pure love, understanding, knowing. I was still shocked as I thought angels should be kind of serious, not happy and laughing. To write this takes time, yet all the above happened in what seemed like an instant, yet fully, deeply experienced in an impact I hadn't even felt before. I also registered that the angel was neither male nor female, yet both. You can imagine why it has been so hard to describe this. The angel told me that if I really wished to die, I could get sick and die quite quickly. This was very matter of fact. This seemed attractive to me, but I I thought of my son and wanted to be there on earth for him. This also felt impossible as I had three people on earth that I had harbored anger and resentment toward for a long time. I'd been doing a lot of personal development work, and yet no matter how hard I tried, I couldn't release this. I hated feeling that way, yet seemed unable to change it. I just didn't want to go back living with that obsessive, destructive anger and bitterness. As soon as I thought, said this, a brighter spot of light was at the end of the tunnel, which seemed a long way off, yet... We met almost immediately. It was blinding light. At first I couldn't see. This is strange because I didn't actually have eyes. But I knew this was Jesus. 
This was even more of a shock because I didn't believe in Jesus either, which also seemed funny. This quality of humor is one of the most surprising and wonderful things about my experience, and one I can remember the feel of. It is an all-loving, all-knowing, all-permeating acceptance. Again, my words don't do this justice in any way. It was like, yes, I exist. Isn't that wonderful? I'm glad you're enjoying discovering this. I was just basking in the presence of this love. I seem to be sad about going back and experiencing all the human things again, in particular the anger and bitterness. I just wanted to stay there. I was asked, is it the anger and bitterness that stops you from going back? I answered, yes. Jesus seemed to move his arm towards me, and yet he didn't, and a beam of light passed through me. The light was both a beam, like a lighthouse beam, and yet from or part of him. It was as if someone pulled the plug out. I felt all the hurt and anger and bitterness drain out of me like an actual substance. I had a sense of emptying. Next, I have a sense of be ha having been shown what it was I had to do again. Path, but I have forgotten what it is. However, when something happens in my life that is a part of that, I get the feeling that I know it is connected to that. Sometimes it's even as though a hand is at my back, gently supporting and moving me forward. I was feeling so empty and relieved and amazed and yet calm. I was joined by another angel. I didn't want to go back, but knew I was going to, and that was okay. They moved with me a bit down the tunnel, and then suddenly I was back in my body, on my bed. I was stunned, heavy, very heavy. My body felt alien to me, like I didn't fit. It felt yucky. Dead meat is an expression I've read, and it really fits. I was confused. What had just happened? I had some memory knowing, like, there's no such thing as time. I was always living by the clock. In the cosmic sense, time does not exist. Everything is perfect. Nothing is wrong. Even the greatest evil to us is, in our limited thinking is the way it is meant to be. I tried hard to remember what I was supposed to do, but knew it was okay. It would all happen, unfold. Then I remembered the draining. I felt into myself, no anger, no bitterness, no wish for revenge. I couldn't believe it, but it was true. I thought of the worst that had happened to me. Still, no anger. I scoured my mind for all the things I had been obsessing about for years. There was just peace. At that instant, I knew that whatever it was that had just happened to me, it had changed my life, and it didn't matter what it was. It was good. I just spontaneously started praying my thanks, my gratitude. The rest of the day I was scared this feeling would go away. Every time I tested, no anger. I just fell to my knees and prayed my gratitude and thanks. Now I feel I'm at the part of my life where whatever it is I'm supposed to do is near. Part of this is telling about my experience. Just to put more information out there, I guess writing it is a big step. And here his report ends. In the second selection, caregiver has her own NDE, a strange merging with her sister, and a lengthy shared death experience during her sister's passing from cancer. The experiencer writes, My sister Kate had been living with cancer for 10 years prior to this experience. In December 2022, she came to my home on hospice care. There were three connected experiences that happened in the time period from 16 December 2022 to the 25th of January 2023 when Kate left this world. First was when I found myself in hospital with anaphylactic shock on December 23rd, 2022. I had an NDE there where I found myself back in my living room up near the ceiling looking down on Kate in the hospice bed. The rest of the room was in a gray mist. Her friend was sitting on the couch. I perceived my question, what will happen to her if I die? The answer, it's okay, she will be fine. 
Then all her and my animals flashed before my eyes, and I asked the same question with the same answer coming back to me. Lastly, the faces of my three grown children flashed and then stayed together in my sight. And the same question. Halfway through that answer, I felt my hesitation and felt emotional at leaving them, and immediately that part of this experience was over. There is more to this experience after I woke up and was told I could go home. The second experience was while I was home and Kate was sleeping in her bed in the living room. I went to take a shower while a friend watched her. This incident with Kate happened three times. While standing in the shower, it felt as if Kate was somehow fully inside my body, from head to toe. I was aware of standing in the shower and was myself as well as being Kate. I was also outside myself, standing directly in front of me, face to face, but seeing Kate. I knew that Kate was me, and I was Kate, and another me was standing outside of the original me, watching this. The first time I could hear in my head Kate saying with a laugh, Ha ha! Look at what I can do, sis. It was a very quick experience. The second time I could just feel me being both of us and reached my hand up to feel my hair. I felt Kate's hair. Hers is much coarser than mine. I felt slight shock and the word whoa came to mind and then it was over. The third time I felt this, I asked her to please stop doing this. I was utterly exhausted as her sole and full-time caregiver and could not process this as well. She stopped. Kate lived until the 25th of January, the last days she was unresponsive. <clears throat> A friend helped me tremendously during this time by sitting with me the last two nights of Kate's life. Neither of us got much sleep at all, not wanting to be asleep when she passed. At close to 7 a.m. on January 25th, my friend left to go home and sleep for a while. I locked the door behind her and went back to the living room where Kate was. I started to sit on the couch, but had a deeply strong need to be right at her head with her, so I got up again to move to her. As I got up from the couch, the number 842 lit up like a digital alarm clock in the air in front of me, in large red numbers. The TV had been off for days, no computers were on, and I don't have an alarm clock. I quickly dismissed it as it meant nothing to me at all, and I had Kate on my mind. It was very disconcerting to be alone with her when I knew she would possibly pass away with only me there. I sat next to her hospice bed, looking at her, knowing that I would not have her with me for much longer, listening to her slightly labored breathing, watching her chest rise and fall with quick intakes of breath and the longest exhales that had my soul on edge. I was grateful that her forehead was smooth, no signs of stress or pain, but small, almost imperceptible changing expressions, an occasional flash of puzzlement or worry, a slight frown or sideways nod of her head, and then it was as if I heard her inside my head, or rather just felt what she needed. It felt as if she knew she was leaving, but did not know how, which way to go, and wanted me to go with her. She had said on the previous Thursday that she felt that there were two of us going, but I told her that I'm not going to die yet. I told her that her dying would make her me feel uh, like it, but that I would not be going with her. Little did I know. So I rearranged my chair, dropped the railing on the bed, and leaned in close, my mouth right near her ear. First I sang or hummed the Tula Tula song that our dad had sung when she was stung by a blue bottle when she was about five years old. It's an old African lullaby. He put her on his shoulder and ran down the beach going for help, all the while singing, humming that song. It was incredibly soothing and, and caring, and I had not even thought of it for many, many years, but there it was, softly spilling from my mouth right into her ear. From there on, it was simply in, I was simply in a situation that I somehow knew what to say and do. I had no plan how to do this, no idea what I was going to say or do, or what to expect. And yet I knew what I was doing, 
what needed to be done for Kate. I had no idea this was possible, and I was not distressed or emotional. This just was happening, and I was doing this. I was aware that the living room had disappeared. Everything was a light, unremarkable gray, and both my body and her body had only our head and upper chest area visible. Then it was as if I went deeper and we were standing on a dirt road. The road was smooth dirt, no rocks or potholes. We just were there. There was no landing, no getting there. We were just there. I could feel her stress and tension and knew that she was worried or rather apprehensive. I remember feeling really calm, almost smiling, as I told her that she could stand and walk properly again without pain or worries or falling, and to give it a try. She bounced a bit on her feet, and I could feel her relief and joy at the lack of pain and her ability to move freely. I pointed out to her this gently convex road, told her that this was the way we had to walk, and waited a minute as she adjusted, standing upright, straight, and without pain. This road was not a surfaced road. It was just a rather nondescript dirt road, a very light dirt color, slightly narrow, somehow comfortable-feeling road. At the very start of this road, there was a stripe in the middle, like on a real road, but that went away as I felt we were together, standing, looking into the distance. The sides of the road were both colorful, covered with plants, bushes, trees, and flowers, and also bland or plain. Nothing remarkable there. Then it became more bland as we slowly started to walk. There were muted color. There were was muted color there at the start, but then it was more important to just walk, be together, and the color would be distracting. So it left. When I first found us on this road, I was aware of muted, almost pastel color, but nothing bright and beautiful as described by others, just calm and gentle. I also felt my instinct as a photographer to want to capture this beauty, but the color almost instantly faded with that quick thought. I knew there was still color, but I, I could not see it anymore. Although there was no color, the flowers, etc., were solid, not see-through. I told her that this was the way to walk, that if she looked way in the distance, she would see what seemed like a large black gate that was not solid, but with vertical bars that one could see through. On each side of the gate was a square white pillar, but nothing to the sides of the gate posts. No scenery, no ground, no road or fence. Give me a minute, she said. She would often say this when getting out of bed, etc., and needed to get used to something new, a new movement or situation. She took her time, and then I encouraged her to keep walking slowly, that I was right next to her and would stay with her all the way. I did not touch her at all, or she me. I was not supporting her. She was solid on her feet. We did not look at each other all the way down the road, nor did we touch in any way, but her thoughts and feelings were known to me. I was aware that our bodies were whole, but I did not look to see my legs or feet. I knew and saw that she stood and walked without a problem. I am also not aware of what we were wearing, nor that we put one foot in front of the other. We moved down the road in some way or other. I told her that behind those gates were all her people, people who wanted her to go with them and that they were all excited that she was on her way. Give me a minute, she said a little breathlessly as she slowed down just a little again. About halfway down the road, Kate said quietly inside my head, I would rather stay here with you. I was fully aware of the distress she felt at this point and spelled, spent a while gently telling her how important she had been in my life, how much I wished she could stay with me. I told her how this was the only way forward and that it was not an option to be able to stay with me. You cannot go back. You cannot stand still, nor can you go left or right. The only road is to go ahead, and I am going to be walking it all the way with you. I won't leave you, I told her. 
She nodded and walked a bit further. I remember a small part of me wondering how I could be so calm while telling her this, but that part of me felt separate from the me that was walking with Kate. After gently encouraging her, taking a few more minutes every now and then, I told her to look at that gate and that it had become much closer. Look through it at all the people behind there waiting for you. Give me a minute, please, she said softly. So we stood for a while, just relaxing and letting her get more comfortable with this process and the progress we were making towards the gate. I could see that there were people there, but not individually at, at this point. I did not feel rushed or that we had a time frame to get to the gate. It was all in her control. As we got closer, I could see now all the people I knew who had died before her, standing on the other side of that huge closed gate. There were no walls or fences on either side of the gate, just the gate and nothing to the sides of it. Our focus was on the gate and now the people behind it. They stood there quietly, just waiting gently for Kate. I kept telling Kate that I would walk all the way with her, that it was all okay and that she was safe. I told her that this was her journey. I was just there to help her get there, and I would stay with her till the end. I told her that no one was going to come and drag her there, that they were going to stay right there until she was ready to go in to them herself. I felt her relief when I said this. I told her that they would only reach to, for her once she reached for them. She seemed to relax little by little as our steps took us closer and closer to the gate. She seemed a little puzzled when she looked at the people, so I started naming some of them, and she seemed to relax even more, and her head nodded slightly to the side as she looked through the gate bars. I could feel that she was feeling more at ease, less stressed, and noticed that she stood a bit more upright. There were many people. Some I recognized but could not place where I knew them from, but I did see my mother, father, aunt, a nephew who had died by suicide, and many more I knew, friends who had recently passed and also those who had been long gone. I recognized them, knew who they were, but they had no facial features that I could see. They appeared to me like minimalist art, where the artist takes a paintbrush and one stroke is the dress or pants, another brush stroke was the shirt, and a round dot or blob, the featureless face. Again, I knew their clothing had color and even patterns. I just could not see it. And then we were close to that huge gate, about six feet away. I told her that to open the gate, she could go to, the, to her people. All she had to do was to lift either hand in the air like one does in a classroom. I knew that she needed to control this process, and I was just the support she needed. I told her that before she lifted her hand, I would take one small step backwards, just one step, and that, that this was her journey, and reminded her again that I was not going to be with her now, just getting her there, and I would stay until she was there. Give me a minute, she said, and then, can I look at you once more? I told her to take as long as she needed, and that of course she could look at me again. She turned to look directly into my eyes with those beautiful blue eyes of hers and a relaxed smile, but was quickly drawn back to the people behind the gate. I noticed that she looked healthy, not sick anymore. After one more, give me a minute, her right hand slowly went up in the air. That gate slid silently open to the left, disappearing into the left pillar, not extending beyond it as it it would here. The people stood quietly with their arms at their sides, but with such understanding and patience emanating from them all. So many people we had known were there, and they all looked only at Kate. I was happy that they were all looking at her because this was all about her, and I was only there to help. I felt no negative feelings about her not being noticed by my family and friends, just happiness for Kate that she was being welcomed in this way. 
Kate drew in a deep, even breath and asked for another minute. We stood in utter peace in front of this large group of people and just soaked it in. I could feel Kate almost happy now. Her shoulders were relaxed, and I could feel her peace. After a short while, I quietly asked whether she was ready, to, ready yet, and to be sure only to take the next step when she was totally ready. She half looked back over her left shoulder and asked, Can I wave at you one more time? Of course, I said, as she took a couple of steps forward, and I stayed where I was. Then her left hand lifted up, bent at her elbow and wrist, and she waved at me in a jaunty, happy, relaxed way as she kept walking forward, now with a spring in her step. As her left hand ended her wave to me and went down again, her right hand reached out to the crowd in front of her, and the last few steps were a lot faster and sure and confident. She took that step across the gate opening, and I saw everyone start to greet her with so much joy and comfort. It was as if she was thrown a surprise party with people she'd never expected and had not seen in ages. The hellos were so full of joy. It was all so gentle, so peaceful, and so right. As I watched her being welcomed and her mingling with everyone there, a very thin line formed in the ground along the gate opening. It was a gently waving, hair-thin line that became a gap that grew and grew as everything behind that gate drifted ever so slowly and gently away from me, and a mist softly covered it all. It was a bit like continents drifting apart, I thought. I felt like the part drifting away had a light blue hue to it, but again, I could not see the color, just felt it. Kate never turned back again. This made me happy as I knew that, without a doubt, that she did not need to look back, to want to be here anymore, that she would be just fine. That gate never closed as I watched it all drift away. I heard in my head a voice that said, that was a job well done. It was not a male or female voice, just a gentle, kind voice. Knowing that I had done what Kate needed me to do, that she had needed help, assurance, and company for this final journey here on earth made me feel at peace, and I was deeply grateful that it was me that walked that final walk with her. I felt so deeply in awe of what I had just experienced. Right after this, I had the sensation of being to the left of where I was standing before and saw a mist, fog, or cloud come and enfold me in a cocoon. It was extremely relaxing, and I felt a deep calmness and peace infuse me. While in this cocoon, I was aware of being upright, suspended, but utterly relaxed and calm. And then I felt a quiet pop, and I was back next to Kate's bed in the living room, still leaning over her. The gray mist was gone, and everything was back again. I could hear the cats and dog and outside noises again. Looking up, I noticed that the sun was bright and my eyes caught the clock on the wall. As I registered the time, I looked down again at Kate as her last breath brushed against my face. It was 8.42 a.m. This was the number 8.42 I had seen when this experience first started. At first, I did not realize how much time this had taken as time was not an issue during this experience. After approximately one hour and 40 minutes, my back was not aching from leaning over her bed. I had no discomfort at all. It was only a couple of months later when telling my son this that he pointed out the length of time that had passed. Losing my sister has been devastating. We were extremely close, only 365 days apart in age, close friends, confidants, and supporters of each other in every part of our lives. Together we had an adventure during our lives together, many uh, unusual experiences where what happened to her subsequently happened to me and vice versa, almost like extensions of each other, even in looks. This experience has somehow made it a little 
less painful, enabling me to cope with life here, absolutely knowing that she is just fine. I've had a few other experiences with her and one visual visitation after her death that show me that she is still close by and encouraging me to go on, live my life to the fullest. With all this said, I have a need to do something with this experience, combined with my others too, to help people where, when and if they are scared to cross over. Never knowing that a shared death experience existed, this has opened up a whole new world to me. I also now recognize that I had a very different kind of shared death experience with an ex-husband a few years back, but had no clue what happened, so pushed that experience away until it surfaced again when I started to research what had happened on this walk with Kate. The only thing I have found recently that comes remotely close to my experience was written by uh, Judy Hilliard, where she talks about the old Celtic traditions of Anam Kara and Anam Ara, where they accompanied souls to the, to the other side. A main aspect of this experience for me is that this was not showing me anything, no beautiful colors, angels, beings, lights, beautiful music, visions, no tunnel or message to bring back or teach or direct me. It was, as that voice said, a job that I had to do, was chosen for, or chose to do, a privilege I am deeply honored and, to be frank, totally awed that I was able to do, to be able to see that Kate, my dear sister, my other half, is both safe and happy is a priceless gift. And here the report ends. And also our show for today. My thanks to IONS for all they do, and I would encourage experiencers to write up their own STEs and send them to IONS. If you'd like to hear this show again or any of our more than 500 archived ad-free NDE interviews, go to TalkZone's NDE radio site and hit the Past Shows button, or go to our YouTube channel, NDE Radio with Lee Whitting, where you can subscribe to and comment on the complete NDE radio library. And be sure to check out our NDE Radio Facebook page. Just search NDE Radio with Lee Whitting on your Facebook app. And listen again next Monday, 11 a.m. Eastern at Talk Zone for more NDE Radio. I'm your host, Lee Whitting, saying thanks for listening.